and we are ready here. So stand by, camera rolling, record, <laughs> and pan on to me. So, dear guests, uh, welcome to our third uh, performance research seminar, which is um, now running in its third year. Uh, and in its second year as a collaboration, come a bit closer, Misha, so that I can also <laughs> use your microphone, as a, as a production that is both local, um, here at Cornell University in the uh, theater department, as well as uh, online, we are broadcasting live to the Dance Tech TV, and so we welcome also our online visitors, as well as uh, our local audience. And I am uh, very delighted to um, introduce um, uh, Misha Myers from the University of Falmouth, uh, incorporating the very well-known and famous Dartington College, which has moved to Falmouth. Yeah? Um, Misha Myers is um, a lecturer there and researcher, an artist and performer who has developed a very a specific body of work that links live performance with site-specific performance, media, storytelling, re-performances. And you, you say in your note that uh, you are currently working on performative fictocritical dialogues. And in her mm. presentation today, I think she will be introducing some of this dialogic mm. work. And she has done extensive work also dealing with places, mm -hmm. with walking, with, I guess, the um, uh, uh, sort of notion of homeland or foreign lands. And um, the artist that she probably will mention today is uh, an American artist, Jimmy Durham, whose work I greatly admire. I remember once reading about him as a, as a trickster figure, <laughs> uh, uh, in intervening into stereotypical or ideological representations of culture. And uh, Durham himself, I think, is Native American. Mm. So, I don't know whether uh, you have encountered him there or here, but uh, you are based in Cornwall, on the furthest, remotest side of uh, the UK. <laughs> and we are delighted to have you here, so please welcome Misha Myers. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Okay. Title of this presentation, performance lecture, is Is That a Pistol in Your Pocket? Corral Consciousness and the performance of enclosure and concealment. Prologue. Every time the United States acts forcefully, forcefully abroad to protect its interest, you can bet the farm some pencil neck in America or Europe will whip out the charge that America once more is acting like a cowboy. That acting like a cowboy is about the most horrible thing one could do. Bruce Thornton in Free Republic. Charging onward. <laughs> it's high noon. A stranger comes to town, searching, speculating. Close up shot from ground level. Dark figure in cowboy hat, bat wing yoked shirt, boot and jeans or California riding skirt in this instance, foregrounded against a big blue sky with thunderclouds approaching in the distance. Theme song from Gunfight at the OK Corral. For the exhibition he co-curated with Richard William Hill at Compton Verney, exploring the American West, Jimmy Durham wrote, this kit has an understood gun. The wearer and the public know that the gun is there. Every cowboy suit has a gun. And a script, of course, in quote. This hair kit comes complete with the requisite firepower and master narrative. But wait, there's a woman in that hat to boot. What is, what is her role in the script? I'll come back to her later, as there's another part I want to address first that of the silent Indian. The Tonto or Quigag, Quigag who is always a passive witness to the cowboy's action, according to Durham. How to intervene with the tightness of this script? 
In his essay, Cowboys and, written in 1990, Durham recognized that America becomes more closed but kinder and gentler as it attempts to keep up with the concomitant niceties of a democratic empire and to model Europe's forced and tokenized receptivity to interventions in its myths. This narrowing ideology that I will call corral consciousness is what Durham proposed as a potential weakness in the system and that triggered his continuous experiments. As the current narrative threat to national and global security is reinforced globally, in the United States more particularly, through the production of panic and fear, we see a corralling of codes and enactments of manifest destiny. This corralling delimits, erases, collapses, and conceals positionalities and potentialities, while proliferating illegible, invisible, illegitim illegitimate, and criminal identities within the ho unhomely homeland state of emergency and abroad on new frontiers of Indian territory. The enemy is close to home, both within and without. No, this scenario is not new to the US, and I'm wondering how do I avoid that part in the script that allows me, in my liberal-mindedness, to walk away into the distance with a knowing smile and hands washed clean of the whole scene. In the enclosure of corral consciousness, I am searching for the strategies to avoid distance, distancing myself or silencing an active witness in this script. In Durham's exhibition at Matt's Gallery in London, Building a Nation, 2006, he strategically placed mirrors throughout the installation so that the viewer would see their own reflection as they read genocidal quotations by famous Americans that were photocopied or transcribed and pinned to the walls or on top of objects. In the booklet accompanying the exhibition, Richard William Hill suggests that these quotations are kind of evidence and towards of evidence of the violence towards indigenous people that underlies but is hidden within the foundations the United States was built on. During a series of performances held throughout the exhibition, Durham would work on the exhibition, building the installation, and then speak about ideas related to it. He read quotations and sang songs. Hill writes, nation building is an intimate affair, completed one mind at a time in the privacy of your home as you do the things you most enjoy often in a state of childish innocence, such as dressing up like a cowboy, or an Indian, or, or a cowboy as Indian, or singing as Durham did at some point in Building a Nation. He's an Indian, you're an Indian, I'm an Indian too, a Sioux! <laughs> Irving Berlin from Annie Get Your Gun in Durham. As Hill suggests, there are nations that need unbuilding. Durham is a, car a carpenter that unbuilds with tools such as those Gerald Wisner refers to as practices of survivance, of native peoples, the refusal of domination and annihilation of their cultures and their sovereignty through the active and resilient presence in their stories, traditions, customs, and narrative resistance. So while Durham's mirrors address the viewer and invite them to actively witness and question the US's ideological foundations, there is also an allusion to the funhouse fun mirror of Hollywood that replicates the iconic image of the cowboy over and over and over and over and over again, instructing Americans how to be cowboys in a cycle quote, of anticipation and mi mimicry. It's all one reflection after another, regressing back to nothing. According to Hill, all the genuine complexity and diversity of American experience disappears in the process. With the development of the cowboy and Indian stories of the dime novels and the Wild West shows into Western film, this image and the ideology of manifest destiny went global for worldwide consumption 
at a time when the survival of native peoples was most vulnerable. Laura Mulvey likens this thickening of this mythological plot as, quote, a huge smokescreen. Jean Fisher warns, quote, to base an ideology and identity on nostalgic myths is to be doomed to repetition, incapable of seeing and responding to the political realities of the present. After reading Durham's Cowboys and, I wondered, what would happen if the American origin myth was deported or evicted back to that land from which the particular European brand of this narrative was first exported? So I put on my boots and spurs to state a cross-dressing and undressing of this master narrative. In 2004, as part of a month-long series of performances and an installation commissioned by SpaceX Gallery and Relational for their public exhibition, Homeland, I restaged and rebranded a version of the Wild West show, complete with its newly improved dimensions, added features of imaginary savages and tribal barbarians in the guise of extremist terrorists and the contemporary grade A brand democratizing and colonizing currently being waged within this circling wagon train of corral consciousness. It's high noon. Enter the cowgirl, a wandering cowgirl of dubious authenticity and origin, presenting a stonewashed, tired out remnant of that legendary Wild West action show upholding the values of an urban society on the move, chasing a ghost of a chance called manifest destiny. The cowgirl led a roundup, transforming Exeter's old Roman walls into a rodeo corral with renegade rodeo pageantry. That's Exeter, UK. A posse of the city's very own line dancers, Montgomery Mavericks, followed along. Their steps, of their dances around the walls echoed those of Exeter's forsaken ritual, the annual mural walk. Along this past circumambulation, transgressors of the security and prestige the walls once upheld were named and shamed. In this more recent promenade, the cowgirl sang yodels and cowboy ballads of hangings, prison breaks, wandering, homesteading, land grabbing, etc., with the lyrics replaced with geographical and historical details specific to Exeter's past and present. So in a daring feat guaranteed to knock your boots off, a familiar site of English heritage was displaced with a Hollywood film set of the mythological Wild West, and the forgotten rituals of beating the bounds of the city were transformed into rodeo pageantry. At the culmination of Homeland, the contextual and durational diorama sideshow, Lonesome Long Gone, was performed in the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, Exeter, in a glass case exhibition, a uh, glass case between an exhibition of Shell Motor Oil's original publicity posters and a buffalo exhibit in the museum's natural history room. Over a three-hour period, the cowgirl performed sharpshooting demonstrations, reenactments of dying scenes from Western films, melancholic line dances to Western theme tunes, cowboy ballads while strumming an out-of-tune guitar, balderdash from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show billboards, and readings of the original Victorian dime novel and Penny Dreadful version of The Adventurers of Buffalo Bill, with her presence and contemporary events in the Middle East inserted into the embellished accounts. Step right up, buckaroos, for one day only, from high noon to high tea, in our grand arena, a proudly preeminent exhibition of universal interest with newly added features, this year surpassing its stupendous self. Whip cracking, sharp shooting, trick riding, game hunting, bronc busting, and other daring feats, great, grand, and heroic, with more than enough rough, rugged riders of the world, a gathering of extraordinary consequence. 
fittingly illustrating that all that virile, muscular, heroic manhood has and can endure, presenting the gigantic military spectacle of enduring freedom and other actual scenes of ambush, stakeout, hideout, shootout, Come one, come all, it's a blaze of glory blowout, the awfulest, beatenest show on earth. As a method of researching Durham's strategies of interruption, I staged a reenactment of a moment of building a nation for a per performance reenactment society photo shoot. It is a kind of research that I do through the doing of a thing. I took a crooked tree branch from my log pile at home, put on my partner's work shirt, and tied a black cloth around my head. I transcribed the following quotation from, pre from President Theodore Roosevelt from 1886 onto a piece of paper, which read, I don't think, I don't go as far to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians. But I believe nine out of ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. Theodore Roosevelt in Durham. I pinned the page to the branch and attached the branch to a timber with black gaffer tape. Then I posed for a camera while smelling the branch. After Hugo Glendening finished taking the shot, another member of PRS, Tom Marshman, asked me what was going on in my life and the world when I saw this work. I confessed that I never saw the exhibition of performances in person, but only experienced it secondhand through Durham's writings and documentation and others' accounts of their experience and of the work. Marshman reassured me that this was well within the rules of PRS but I was somewhat relieved, but not entirely convinced. There is something so deeply unsatisfying about not having been there, and even more so when trying to write about it third hand. So I was attempting to bring myself there through this doing to create some kind of dialogue with the work and the experience of it. I'm interested in the doing and how the thing done the thing is done, and that is one of the things about Durham's work that impresses me or has left its imprint on me. The way he generates discourse in his installations, performances, writings, etc., between the object's words and the viewer reader, or the way he integrates the work and his processes of making it within the installations or objects he creates, both his method of making art and political discourse. So I told Marshman that what was going on in my life while researching this work was the dissembling of my home, the disassembling, as I prepared to move my family with my job, and what was going on in the wider world at that moment was Obama's missed deadline for dismantling Guantanamo. Having said this out loud, I did pause to reflect on what connections there might be between all of this, if any. And then Marshman asked me what I was thinking about while I was posing for the camera, and I told him that I was wondering what Durham must have been thinking about when he sniffed the branch gathered from Victoria Park in Hackney. I smelled the dried red Devon mud of my own stick that I'd picked up one of my, on one of my regular walks near my home. I liked the shape of the stick, that I'd, and I'd put it on my log pile, but I didn't really want to use it for the fire. So this led me to think about the work, Durham's work, Untitled, from 1992, which was included in his exhibition, Original Reruns, at the ICA London, 1994. It included a glass fish eye attached to a stick, painted red, accompanied by a text, an open letter to the public to whom it may concern. And in the text, Durham narrates a process of making the object and a problem with the concept of representation, which progresses from a premeditated idea for the work that doesn't work out to an extemporaneous combining of found materials. He happened to have a glass fish eye and was walking in the woods and saw the stick, which he notes did not remind him of a fish, and it had dog feces on it. 
So I was always so thinking about a description I'd read at this moment. I was attempting to reenact from build this moment from building a nation that suggested Durham, quote, paused to smell the cut limb of the branch as if to ascertain its provenance. It's from the critic Quail. And I was thinking about the power of primitive primitivism and how this gesture of sniffing a stick that could have been off the cuff or it could have been premeditated is relegated then to an iconic or symbolic image as the subject of anthropological and scientific interpretation and dissection. Durham has said of his work, quote, when I try to make art, I don't want to be in a studio and think about a piece of art I want to make. I want to be with a group of people not knowing what I might make. I want a discourse, not an invention. This process of finding out what something was, is, or what it can become through dynamic and discursive relationship is what I'm attempting to do in making this photograph. I tried hanging up a mirror as part of my reenactment. I wanted to catch an image of the camera and of Hugo Glendening, the photographer, but this didn't work out the way I thought it would. When the final photo was hung up to dry, people commented that it didn't look like me, and it doesn't look like Durham either. I wasn't trying to be Jeremy Durham or myself. I didn't want to pen up either of us, up or down. I wanted to create a discourse by putting together these second-hand memories of a Jimmy Durham performance. Now that's a long and roundabout way of telling what I was thinking while I was doing, but it also tells you what I'm trying to do here, right now. So meanwhile, back at the ranch. In Durham's essay, Savage Attacks on White Women, as usual, he offers a confession. He was once a cowboy, but didn't enjoy it. He said, quote, only did it for the, money, for, the, for the money. And another cowboy warned him, you're an Indian and a cowboy? Be careful you don't kill yourself. <laughs> confession. When I was younger, I wanted to be a cowboy. Suspicious of my cowboy tendencies, my mother never bought me the boots and hat that I pleaded for. But I was a cowboy for a while with white go-go boots worn, worn with a red, white, and blue jeans, with, which were a makeshift supplement for the real thing. And I did ride in the girls' lead line of the Holmes County Rodeo in Mississippi circa 1975. I must admit, that I did enjoy it, and later on, not that long ago, I did it for the money too. But I fear, and this, this keeps me awake at night, that I really can't ever escape my cowboy tendencies. The wagon train always seems to reappear circling in, even when I try to displace or double cross it, it comes back with bigger guns. Sharp shooting with the girl dead shot. Lesson number one. The problem of the master eye. It is best to keep both eyes open when using a shotgun. You can see the target better and also judge the distance and speed more accurately. Having both eyes open introduces the problem of the master eye. A right-handed shooter having a right master eye will have no difficulty in pointing the gun correctly. However, if the left eye is master, a right-handed shooter will be in difficulties for the gun will be actually pointing to the left of the objects aimed at. Once you have resolved the problem of the master eye, it won't be long before you'll be shooting sharp like the girl dead shot. So tune in for the next installment of Sharp Shooting Lessons with a Girl Deadshot, brought to you by Homeland Insecurities Incorporated. There's a snare built into my liberation. As Durham has pointed out, the US makes adjustments to its self-image, quote, without admitting any new images. 
Indeed, in her online blog, Virginia, Virginia Prostral attributes Sarah Palin's appear, appeal sorry, to this persistence. Quote, she may have wrangled fish, but she shares the cowgirl tradition, end quote. And Alex Massey observes that it is significant, significant that Palin, dressed up as the cowgirl turned sheriff, wouldn't have had the same impact if she had come from Alabama or Ohio, because the idea of the West trumps all other considerations. Trumped again. A cowgirl once told me that the cowgirl legend was inspired by the many women who abandoned the civilized life of the East to live on that vacant and affordable land, read stolen through genocide and removal of indigenous peoples, known as the, Ter the Cherokee Strip. The, ter the territory offered to pioneering families and unmarried individuals of ownership with the Dawes General Allotment Act of, 19, of 1887. In the West, the cowgirl had to be, had to cowboy up and prove herself through the same strange rituals of showing dominance over cattle, according to Durham, and demonstrate her prowess in a saddle with a gun or something else that shoots from the hip. While it was considered a mental illness in the East at the time to want to wear trousers, women in the, in the West rode astride in split skirts. And it was through these acts that she was taken seriously enough to gain suffrage, the legal rights to her own income and lands, and to take up positions as political representatives with the first women's vote legislated in, in Wyoming. From there, many a cowgirl, according to Candace Savage, came looking for a chance to ride astride and to vote. So while Annie Oakley's name appears in the list of TV Westerns entitled Suggested Further Research in Durham's The American West, cowgirls didn't appear in the exhibition, and I wondered about this gap in the spirit of questioning that it inspires. I wonder about the whoopee girl, Texas Gwinnan, born in Texas just before the Allotment Act. She went east, though, to make her fortune as a showgirl. She was best known for her Wild West patter. Like an illusionist, she distracted the attention of the butter and egg men as she referred to her wealthy patrons while she magically emptied their load. Hello, suckers. Give the little ladies a great big hand. Sharp shooting with a girl dead shot. Lesson number two, gun mounting. Assuming the gun fits you, before even considering firing it, you should spend a considerable time practicing gun mounting. Stand in front of a mirror with the gun in the ready position. Push slightly forward with your left hand, and with your right hand, raise the stock to your cheek and the butt into your shoulder. Make sure that the butt of your gun travels in a direct line upwards. Avoid thrusting forward and then drawing back. Practice this movement until you can bring your gun up in a swift, smooth action, always making sure that it ends with your cheek tight on the stock and the right eye in the correct position. Practice this until you do it automatically, and it won't be long before you'll be shooting sharp like the girl Deadshot. So tune in for the next installment of Sharp Shooting Lessons with the Girl Deadshot, brought to you by Homeland Insecurities Incorporated. Durham proposes that the division between Indians and settlers is the hidden operant for all American narratives. A discourse of enclosure and concealment, he says, that is not a product of US, US imperialism, but its instructor. The concealment and its methods have served to take away from Indians a reality in the world, and therefore, he says, our voices in the world. This operational core, quote, has not, cannot be changed. It has ever 
it has broadened, it has been broadcast, end quote. It is this narrative of the ever-expanding horizon of the frontier and the negation of Indians which maintains and instructs the ideological operation of U.S. statism and imperialism and is continuously re-employed and recirculated in the language of U.S. businessmen who speak, for instance, of scalping and circling the wagon train. Indeed, the Wall Street Journal ran an advertisement, with no irony intended, on March 30th, 2005, announcing a Las Vegas land auction, which read, quote, in May 1905, a group of visionary investors traveled for days and camped on the desert floor. On May 4th, 2005, history repeats itself, only this time, the stakes are even higher. Wall Street Journal. In Exeter's shopping area of the town center, the cowgirl brushes elbows with an anti-war demonstration and the town crier and shouts her own cry, a dedication. For all the shoppers of High Street and their restless desires at the East Gate Junction of Virgin Megastore Territory. Then the cowgirl sings a version of the railroad corral. The sun circles upward, the steers as they plod, are pounding the pavement of the hot city sod. It seems when the smog makes you dizzy and sick, that we'll never reach tea time or the cool river X. Oh, slow down, doggies, quit your roving around. You've wandered and trampled all over the ground. Oh, graze along, doggies, and feed kind of slow. And don't be forever on the go. Move slow, doggies, move slow. The role, the role of the cowboy as Indian must be played again and again and over and over to reassure a sense of belonging. To reveal this narrative for what it is is to recognize the contradictory unsettledness of the settler, the stranger that has never been alone on the endless prairies of virgin territory that actually were inhabited by native peoples or at home in what was perceived as a wilderness full of savages. Such a pathological homeland insecurity necessitates the maintenance of a corral consciousness as any intervention revealing the falsity of this underlying master narrative will unleash an unfathomable eviction. The lie of the land must be protected abroad at home at all costs. And its lasso must be abroadly cast to extend and fortify its ground. According to Fisher, quote, the genre finally gives way to imperialistic adventures enacted in the Indian territories of Philippines, Vietnam, Grenada, Mogadishu, Iraq, or cowboys and Indians in space as the author of Star Trek once described the series, end quote. With the enactments of domestic control and ident identity lockdown legitimized by this recirculation of this operational core in the current persistent state of emergency, are such dimensions and identities of the un unknown domesticated or secured, or is the possible terrain of confrontation proliferated and made more visible? Is this a show up or show down? Come one, come all. It's an absolute and root and root and tootin' 100% bona fide. You too can join the outfit. Invest now with money you can afford to lose. You just might get a little liver for your pup, gravel for your goose while having some good, clean family fun. Step right up, folks. Join the ranks. Chase that ghost of a chance. We believe in sequels and excess spending. Hit the big bonanza. Don't miss the gravy train. Roll it in and roll it out soon. Just keep moving in and moving on. When plans go wrong, they offer up another chance. Join our posse of High Plains drifters, sitting high in the saddle on a wild ride, blazing a comet's trail, 
be another wandering star falling through infinite skies. Prospects are always looking up. There's a shimmering oasis to be found beyond the horizon. Always looking up, looking out. There's camping on two planets from prairie to palace to Pluto. The glorious grand ruler of the amusement cosmos presents alien villages, authentic customs, genuine characters of life at the galaxy's frontier. A proudly preeminent exhibition of universal interest blasting off in a blaze of glory. There's just no place like home anymore. My cowgirl performs the ghostly figure of the lonesome, unsettled, and unsettling settler, attempting to show up these rituals of concealment and erasure, which founded and continue founding the unique brand of empire made in the US. This fantasy of return is, of course, an impossibility. This fantasy of eviction, an impossibility. Any authenticated source of origin, after all, is just another untruth along the lost highway. There is no land to which the state of America can or, need, can or needs to return with its ideological and political narrative base. The law of the land is the lie of the land. As Hill instructs, picture a cowboy. Try not to situate him anywhere or otherwise complicate the image. Go for something distilled and iconic, whatever comes to mind without self-conscious reflection. The exercise is to understand his symbolic spatial relationship to the world." End quote. Perhaps I've overcomplicated the picture. The U.S.'s mythic narrative of home as synonymous with nation is never actually located in the land. And Durham recognized this strangeness in the differences of the landscapes of Europe and the Americas. Europe was transported to the Americas by the European settlers, quote, always and obviously never at home here, end quote, Durham. If you look in the summer homes of the robber barons in Newport, Rhode Island, you'll find the inner walls and doorways of European chateaus that were removed and shipped across the Atlantic. So between the alleyway, alleyway Maddox Row in Exeter, decorated in graffiti, and the loading bay at the back of the home furnishing store Habitat, a sign reads, Habitat Loading Bay, Keep Lear. The cowgirl makes a dedication under the watchful eye of a Habitat security guard. For those searching for a home made by Habitat, for those searching for any place, some place to call home. For those dreams of bluer skies, one at any expense. The cowgirl sings a version of Home on the Range. Home, home on Maddox Row. Oh, give me a home where the graffiti row roam, where the skateboards and spray cans play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. In this perambulation around the old city walls of Exeter, the cowgirl risks falling outside or remaining deeper within the circumscribed. She wants to shift the frame to disclose and divulge different paths, roles, unscripted identities. In her multi-referential role of signification and interpretation, different places and times and cultural locations are superimposed so that both times and places must be read through and within one another simultaneously. Moving in and out of the thresholds, doorways, crossroads, and town gates of what remains of these narratives and architectonics of corral consciousness, she is seeking a more dynamic space of signification through movement and relations with others, through an interweaving and juxtaposing of times and places to emancipate, hopefully, new imaginative constructs of identity from the arresting powers and erasures of corral consciousness. In one way, this inhabitation of place may be just another replication of the enactment of this master narrative, 
another erasure of one official and dominant narrative displaced for another, repeating those rights of colonization, the superimposition, displacement, and erasure of one signifying system for another. These rights might be a phony recreation or reenactment of a pre-existing past, separated from the present, a nostalgic longing for better times or traditions when Indians welcomed the innocent settlers as friends. Or this intervention could be seen to comply with the trajectory of commodification of place, the transformation of distinct local identities and places into Hollywood follies, further pit stops along the lost highway. But perhaps I'm overcomplicating the image. How do you unbuild a nation? In the glass case, in the natural history room of Exeter's Royal Albert Memorial Museum, under the gaze of the unblinking eye of the immovable buffalo, the cowgirl repeatedly performs dying scenes. First, there is the impact of a gunshot, and then there is a theatricalized and sometimes prolonged collapse, sometimes a staggering rise, pressed against the glass case. Sometimes there is a convulsion. The buffalo does not respond. The smoke screen has not cleared. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, we move to questions now, and I think what I might do while there are questions. Sure. Sorry, yeah, I will play some video of just in the background. If the camera could pan out, I will try to uh, moderate as well as uh, on occasion repeat questions from the audience so that it can be heard through our camera. So thank you so much, uh, Misha Myers, um, who I think originally hails from the south, Mississippi and is transplanted to the west coast of uh, the UK. Southwest, and, um, yes. <laughs> uh, didn't we have an uh, interesting political event yesterday in the US with the uh, elections, yeah? Yes. I was up all night trying to understand some of the speeches of the Tea Party people. Yes, uh, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, myself, having lived in Texas, I'm very, very uh, familiar with at least the image, the icon mm. of the cowboy and the um, I guess the mythology around it, but uh, I had a first uh, just introductory question perhaps just for um, my curiosity. I was a member of the Houston uh, anthropology crowd and at some point in the 90s this term fictocritical came up when they were talking about ethnographic mm -hmm. research as if there were elements in the way you describe, uh, let's say, um, um, a social or a political or a cultural scenario through some form of um, both uh, perhaps real and an invented um, performance. Mm, mm. Ficto, ficto critical. How do you use this term? Well, I'm using it's interesting because this this paper, by the way, I didn't say this at the end. Um, this is part of a, a paper which I wrote um, for a special issue of Performance Paradigm which uh, Michael Tossig um, was, was part of the contributors and yes. fictocritical um, mm. dialogue came out of um, that um, context but it's also it's what I consider what I do through both this work that you're seeing here there's a but um, you know in that context yes there's an anthropological anthropological context but I think it's really useful for thinking about how as a performance maker we engage with concepts, research, um, and in this paper, this presentation, um, I'm, I'm taking my archive of material and, and meeting that with Jimmy Durham's and uh, trying to stage a dialogue, because that's what the brief was for this issue, was to, um, it was set up as uh, conversations with, conversations. with Jimmy Durham. Look so at this gorgeous choreography. Is this a, is this a dance? <laughs> this is the line dance that they were performing, yeah. It, it's almost as if they were 
on the sidelines of the cowboys, uh, Dallas Cowboys, doing the cheating. Yes. That's <laughs> It's, um, uh, it's a different context. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for our for our many uh, viewers from the dance tech community, this, yeah, this yeah. choreographic <laughs> bit is important. Can yes, you, yes. Can you illuminate? Well, this is the Montgomery Mavericks, the local line dance company in Exeter, and um, oh, they're in Exeter. They're from Exeter. yeah, they're from Exeter. They are completely the leader of the group. Uh, two of the, the two leaders of the group completely committed to cowboy lifestyle. Um, he's a truck driver, and uh, they meet every week. And it's a very much a social event, and um, they were fantastic collaborators actually. But it was really interesting actually engaging with their version of cowboy and my version of cowboy. <laughs> See, I, I knew. Uh, please, my uh, please come in now. From now on, I'm opening the floor. Of course, you're welcome. Please, but. Uh, the, the heritage tradition in England often means a reenactment of medieval yeah, jousts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, I yeah. did not know that uh, they were reenacting cowboys. <laughs> uh, this is completely. Well, this is me. my. This is. Well, I mean, there's loads of it actually in Cornwall. I've been yeah. told that uh, the the mine in every kind of mining amusement park that they have yeah. now in the abandoned mines, they have cowboy. Um, dioramas or events, cowboy festivals. <laughs> I'm so excited that I get to go and explore this work there. But yeah, there's yeah, real the, interest in the, cowboys the, the there. The tradition, if I remember also in the terms of performance art intervention, uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña, yeah. Jimmy Durham, to exhibit yourself as a, an, a cultural artifact yeah, mm, or, or mm, as, a, mm. as a native artifact is yeah. interesting because when you go to museums of natural history, their tendency is to have dioramas yeah. with uh, display habitats yes. of uh, of indigenous yeah, people, yeah. yeah, and it's a, a very strange and and bizarre way of exhibiting culture, yeah. Mm. And so I think artists like Durham um, play on that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you play on that, yeah, play. playing on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the sector critical. <laughs> we'll open the floor. Um, I'd just like to ask. What did you find different between these English cowboys? Because they, they, they kind of seem, you said, they seem like English cowboys and the native, um, I'm saying Native American, but not as in an Indian Native American, but mm. like American cowboys. Because as you said before in, the, in your speech, the idea of cowboy kind of really did stem from England because cowboys were European. So is it similar or are they a lot more? Because the acts, the acts that cowboys would do over in England, I guess, are different. Cause it's a different form of life here. Mm. Well, it's just the the um, I was referring to. I mean, it's interesting because I mean the cowboy itself. The authenticity of that, I'm questioning. I mean, the, the shoes, the shoes come from Mongolia, the design, but they would have had a bigger heel, actually, for riding in Mongolia. Um, the hat is Spanish, from Spanish kind of influence. Um, so uh, there's a real interesting kind of, you know, it's, this, it's a, an invention, you know, of many different European, uh, European uh, in, interna uh, cultural traditions, practices, art uh, artifacts. But, but my experience with um, this group I, is really interesting because I interviewed a lot of line dance groups for this project to find just the right people to collaborate with me. Um, this is what I do. I engage social groups in my work in different ways. Um, the first group I went to visit were kind of, they would do line dancing in black cocktail dresses and, you know, suits. <laughs> it was very interesting. So I was like, this isn't quite it. Um, then I came across this group. They're amazing. They were, um, they just really lived, I say they lived the two people who ran it. There's, uh, I, I, they kind of lived this lifestyle. Their home was a complete museum, actually, of artifacts. Mm. Um, they go to America all the time. They go to country music um, venues. And there's something about their relationship to that, which is obviously very different from mine, having grown up in the South, which also has a kind of nostalgic relationship. Because Mississippi is not Texas, where the rodeo and all of that comes from. But somehow, you know, we claim that. You know, and, and I was brought up with that, that, you know, in the rodeo. That was my first performance venue, was rodeo. Um, but there's still a different kind of nostalgia with this group and their kind of relationship to that. 
um, which, you know, I, I think it, it, maybe it's more uh, about childhood, you know, the Western films, the, um, the boys' annuals, those, you know, the, there's something, the game, you know, the, and, and that's probably the case for a lot of Americans as well, but it's complex. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, can sorry. we go sorry. here? Mm -hmm. and then, sorry. Okay. No, I was just wondering when you interviewed these cowboys and girls from South England, yes. uh, <laughs> did you ask them about their views about concealment of Native American culture and the whole sort of subscript that you're really implying by mm, these mm. that is, you know, a kind of real, you know, something very ominous? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what I'm picking up about yeah. the way that this is all quite distasteful. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not missing anything here, am I? No, that's, so, you know, so it's... What do, they, what do they feel about it? Well, Let's repeat the question for yeah. the camera. Um, mm. The question is whether uh, Misha has asked the uh, South Englanders, yeah, uh, whether they were aware of some of the concealment of Native American culture that happens in these, in these uh, stagings. Mm. And, and, and how, how you felt about mm. that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question that's come up before in a different way because there's a kind of problematic relationship. And there's an ethical question that within the practice um, um, where there's an irony and there's another agenda. You know, I have this agenda. I never asked them about that explicitly, but talked to them about what I was doing. You know, that I, I made a film actually um, that was part of the installation, which was called Pain Town. And one of the leaders, the leader of the group, grew up in Painton, where I filmed this. Um, and I said, you know, I hope you're not going to be offended by this film I've made called Pain Town, because you know it's a real, um, it, it it takes a very particular look at Painton, um, and. We talked about that, and she didn't feel that way at all. She kind of, you know, there was something, I'm not sure how, you know, much they could engage, you know, with that. We didn't discuss those kind of theoretical issues, but, um, but those were, you know, there were questions. There are, have questions come up about the irony, and I, I sit very uneasily with, I'm not trying to use these people to uh, make fun of them. Um, in any way, um, and yet um, I'm trying to look at you know this this where it's it's, it's happening all the time, this kind of um, recirculation of this imagery, and the kind of unquestioning embracing of it certainly, but you know it also has a, a kind of function for them. It's interesting, which is you know a very different relationship that I have to it, having kind of grown up in the U.S. Um, yeah, but trying to, to ask those questions through the irony of it and through, through the kind of meeting of these two. Yeah, that, that's the thing, I think, you know, through the, the kinds of texts that come through it throughout the piece and the yodeling, the songs that I sing, it becomes clear these questions of, um, of this kind of whole icon iconic, <laughs> yeah. Symbolism and iconography. You had your hand up, but uh, to to look at the movement again, immediately comes to mind a spectacle I recently witnessed in Leicester of Morris dancers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people who dress up as Morris dancers are also, in a sense, appropriating a sort of exotic yeah, well, that's interesting. culture, which is not actually their own, but it's uh, some kind of native tradition? Yeah. Mm. That, no one really knows where it actually comes from. Do, do you know where Morris dancing comes from? Because I asked the Morris dancers, and they didn't really know. Mm, mm. Yeah? It's an old English tradition, Morris dancing. Is it? it goes back quite a long way to medieval times. Yeah. It's like Lancashire or Lincoln, somewhere like that. It's got links with Mama's place. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Still, like you wanted to come in. Oh, it was, I guess, a comment on, um, on, on having lived in Japan for a, a long time and and, and seeing how, you know, appropriation of, of Western cultural practices are sometimes, are sometimes kind of visualised in, in, in Japan. And um, I think the only thing stranger than seeing this line <laughs> dancing here is seeing line, line dancing done in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, but the other interesting thing is that they do it very well. Mm. And, uh, you know, ja uh, uh, American baseball has become a Japanese pastime, and in fact, 
recent uh, Japanese pro teams beat them. Yeah. Visiting Americans. So it, it's a kind of a, it becomes more of a, more than a, an appropriation, but mm. in a sense, a real relocation <laughs> and, and, a, and, a, and a re, and a re, a, 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 a re-practicing um, to the point where, you know, what's authentic becomes less and less mm. meaningful. Mm. Uh, so you don't have to locate, uh, you don't have to have something that's authentic um, located in mm. a special time or even a, in a special historical place. Mm. You know, the, 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 the appropriation is done so effectively. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but if you don't like to answer that question, maybe you can just sing some more songs. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting at what point, you know, in that it's like, because line dancing is huge all over. It's huge in Scotland and um, um, and and country music. And I, I just, yeah, I'm very curious about, about that, how much of that with line dancing is about, the, it's a very social dance. You know that you dance. You don't dance in couples, and you don't. Da you know you dance together, which is um, interest. You know, is a different kind of dancing than the ballroom dancing. So, but you know, how much of it is also about the cowboy and the image of the cowboy, and you know, that that's what was interesting about this group too. Is you know, they kind of this whole attitude that kind of came with it that they totally had taken up, which you can see in their body language. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the group in, you know, the ballroom group in their black cocktail dresses was totally, this is what, it just was not right for what, you know, because they hadn't really taken that into it, which is interesting. I was quite curious about how the embodiment of it. So, yeah, interested how, yeah, how they do it in Japan. How, they <laughs> how does that meet? Or it might be an equivalent to a kind of viral hmm. meme-like, you know. Yes. In other words, it's not some, it's not, Necessarily so important that they're wearing hats and no, yeah, belts, yeah, yeah. It's just this little kind of simple way of moving that can be, you know, kind of repeated and yeah, that proliferates and, and then just becomes kind of pathological. Yes, I like that viral, the viral cowboy <laughs> tendencies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it is, but it just keeps replicating itself, you know, again and yeah, again and again. Really you consider like culture or anything else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it has this attractiveness. What is that? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Again, I think maybe not so much in our uh, uh, department here, but perhaps where you are, this interest in cultural performance is, is fascinating because mm. when you mention Japan, uh, isn't also the tango phenomenon, yeah, that mm. you can go to so many different countries, whether it's Canada yeah. or Japan or uh, South Korea, there will be tango people meeting every Thursday night to, to dance the tango. Mm. How do these um, um, forms of, I guess, behavior or dance or social yeah, mm. performance uh, travel and become picked up and then uh, how do they circulate? Mm. Or, uh, or the dimension of concealment or enclosure Perhaps mm. it's not addressed in these cases, but again, the tango has a specific social history. Yeah? Yes, and yes, and a sure political that that history means that means anything to the people in, in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah? Mm. Um, so that gets lost. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what the, the, this question from the woman about yeah. you know discussing that with this group. I mean, that's yeah, that's not something that they're thinking about. You know, thinking about it in different ways. Yeah. Mm. Other questions from the floor. I like very much the idea that uh, discourse or dialogue can, uh, you know, can or possibly should be generated by, by the doing, by the process. Mm. Um, I think this is very important in mm. in our performative practices. Mm. That uh, you know, uh, ideas aren't a priori, and yeah. uh, you know, I think meaningful ideas are generated through the doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's also why I like uh, Jimmy Durham. Yeah. There's a sense of, I mean, with my work and, you know, what I like about his work is this kind of, um, that things can just take so many forms. They keep, I keep reinventing the work. And I don't think, you know, like this is not the theoretical analysis or discussion or 
um, interpretation of the work, what I've just presented to you. It's another form of that work. And all of the work itself is a form of production of knowledge and a expression and communication of that knowledge. Um, but what, you know, one of the things through this piece, when I, you know, I did, I read Cowboys and at the time I was, you know, working with this material and um, that question, you know, there are many questions that have kind of informed the making of that work, but certainly um, Durham's work was important to it and, and provocative. It provoked me to do something. So I think there's, there's an interesting, so this piece is kind of going back to acknowledge that in some way and to actually engage with it in a, in a different level and to really kind of engage with the ideas that first provoked me. So I think that's kind of an interesting in terms of that kind of dialogue and discourse, you know, the circulation of discourse, but how works um, that the performance is happening different in lots of different forms. It's not, you know, a separate activity. I think but you have a romantic nostalgia for an American past or any, any other <laughs> past is so driven now by, by the sort of cinematic experience. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. How that sort of generates kind of safe and and and, uh, and, and uh, you know and and nostalgic mm. uh, desire. Mm. Um, so d desire isn't generated through you know physical encounter and and sort of and in hot passionate and messy ways, but <laughs> rather you know through through sort of sleeping through a a movie. <laughs> And interestingly, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, I, if I may ask, uh, mm. the film music that she sang to, for me, evokes um, the spaghetti westerns, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is already, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yes, well, that's really <laughs> is a certain sort of ironic yeah. distance to the material, right? Yeah, 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 because the, absolutely. The Mor Morricone tradition yeah. is, is actually ironic, yeah. right? Yeah. And we maybe we've forgotten that also. Um, yeah, no, it's true. Well, he was there with the music, but certainly mm -hmm. the the spaghetti um, western, the Italian sets. I mean, that's that's all the, um, you know. I think the the cowboy that we know now, we, there's and the yodeling and all of that being attached. That you really can't say, you know, did that come from actually practices that the cowboy was doing, or was it Hollywood? You know, there's a kind of constructed. Um, Image, yeah, from Switzerland <laughs> via Arizona, <laughs> via Italy, <laughs> and we had to wait and Mongolia. Till, we had to wait till <laughs> we had to wait till two thousand eight when the first queer queer cowboy film was uh, reaching Hollywood. Yeah, mm. with um, Mount, Brokeback Mountain. Yeah, yes, yes, Interesting yes. Interesting how that uh, sort of. Uh, I was in Houston on the official premiere night in mm. a huge theater with. Uh, hundreds of, of gay people from the neighborhood cheering. Mm. It was extremely powerful because I hadn't realized that this could be something you'd rally around yeah, yes. as, a, as a moment. We have our cowboy! Coming out, yeah? <laughs> um, yes. I have a question about this performance reenactment society. Well, I have so to tell you, wait, I have to tell you. That's a real thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fake. Yeah. Yes, yeah. no, that's no, a real yeah. thing, and I'll tell you about But I was going to tell you just anecdotally that I studied Hawaiian hula in <laughs> Hawaii with uh, a Portuguese Hawaiian cowboy, just as an aside. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that no, the Performance Reenactment Society is a real thing. Ironic. No? It's, um, it, well, it may be ironic, but it is Hugo, Hugo Glendening worked with them on creating this series of photographs, but I it's Paul Clark. A fake, a fake archive, no? They're creating an archive, yes. But yes, I mean, it, it, it's yeah, an ironic. <laughs> They are actually, you know, they're working with people like me, suckers, no, <laughs> no who, who have posed for the camera to reenact these images. And it's, it's um, Tom Marshman, uh, Claire, oh, I just gone blank, Claire, excuse me. Um, and Tom was an MA student here. Was he? remember, he oh. would every now and then disappear to Bristol oh, nice. and said, we are shooting. Yeah? And, uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and someone was uh, creating a performance that never happened. Oh, right. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. That's that fantastic. Fake archives. 
an archive of the fake doesn't necessarily <laughs> become a fake archive. No. It folds in on itself. No, but there are yeah, many uh, images, you know, of lots of different performances. Actually, no, like that's a very serious topic, uh, mm. John, uh, if I may ask Misha. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned, yes, you mentioned the relics the relics of the performance archive. And, yes. and my first uh, assignment to our uh, MA group this year is an article called Antigone's Bones, mm. which uh, reflects upon Diana Taylor's uh, writing, uh, Latin American uh, mm. theatre critic, on mm. the archive and the repertoire. Yeah, yeah. And I think when she refers to the archive, she actually does mean the monuments of our traditions. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas the repertoire, I guess, is the living The living traditions, yeah. Um, um, uh, techniques that we have yeah, yeah. to deal with the bones. Mm -hmm. So if the bones are fake, then we get a problem, right? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's a part, I'm, I was talking to a friend of mine who lived in Stirling, and, uh, where William Wallace, his famous battle, and when, a few years ago, 20 years ago, just after the film Braveheart, they erected a statue of William Wallace, looks like Mel Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, because they don't know who to make it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Uh, and I can remember when Denzel Washington was in Malcolm X. There were yeah. posters of Denzel Washington without his name on them, but it just said Malcolm X. So there's a generation of people who thought that Malcolm X and Denzel Washington. <laughs> yeah. 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 kind yeah. of falls yeah. in. Wow. Well, falls in. What, you, what, 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 what is your take on the archive? Well, I mean, this is, you know, there is um, my kind of play upon, you know, the second hand, the third hand, kind of ironic, because it, there, is, there is a kind of um, trying to, uh, I don't know, like this, this, this work itself is, you know, it's a past work that I made, but I've somehow resurrected it, you know, again and again, and it keeps coming back in these different forms. Um, so maybe there is a sense of repertoire there, but... Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, I think the question about um, authentic, the kind of authentic origin of that mm. archive is is always questionable. Mm -hmm. I think that's a kind of linearity of sense of history and time that um, certainly with this kind of material, <laughs> the cowboy, that's mm. exactly what you know. There is where is the authenticity of that that material. Um, but yes, trying to then play with a different maybe, kind of yeah. shape mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. and the shape of, of of sense of you know that the that the artifacts or the relics are never really kind of collecting dust; they're in use and mm. yeah. We have Mike Pearson come next week, mm. uh, who I think is someone interested in theatre archaeology. Mm. But the notion of the relic, I mean, if if yeah, you are interesting. if you are saying we never really know. Uh, this is interesting if you think about it in terms of the church mm -hmm, and the way mm -hmm. religion has dealt with mm -hmm, yes, reliquaries, yes, yes, yes. Yeah? Um, mm. pretending that there is an actual historical um, fact yes. attached to something that mm. is hidden by the church often. In my mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. German uh, hometown, they had a piece of the loincloth of <laughs> uh, Jesus when he was crucified. Mm. And this was hidden from view but every 15 years, it was exhibited hmm. uh, during a procession, <laughs> yeah? and people could, could touch the, the, the thing, yeah? and uh, everyone believed it was the real thing. Yeah? Mm. I'm sure it wasn't, but, um, but it yet, was a good symbol. Yeah? But yet it holds yeah, enormous the holy, power. The holy and cloth, yeah? mm. the holy shroud. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis Leary used to do a little sketch about Roman Catholics who would claim every few years that the Virgin Mary's face had appeared in a muffin. And he used to say, the Catholic Church has got enough money, she wouldn't appear on the muffin. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments and questions? We have five more minutes. Okay. okay. Observations? So. <laughs> No, that's still, yeah. uh, maybe a, a comment on site specificity or the notion of place. Um, mm. uh, was there a particular reason why this is happening in a new area or is it connected to your local research or um, uh, when you are talking about um, 
home, the home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, how do you investigate this in your work? Well, yeah, in this piece, it, I was commissioned by SpaceX Gallery, which um, happened to be about half, you know, 45 minutes from where I was living at the time. Um, so, which was really a great opportunity to really kind of explore and engage um, in the work, um, in, you know, the kind of research and engage with people. I think it was interesting because the, um, and it, it, it was also meeting what they're asking in that, uh, in that exhibition was actually questions about Middle England and home and identity <coughs> in the UK. Um, they had invited um, all of the artists involved in the exhibition were not people that would be perceived as um, uh, belonging or, you know, the, had, you know, different di um, relationship to, you know, a very diverse group of artists. Um, so I was asked to engage with those issues of my own identity um, uh, within, you know, the UK as a, um, a, a a kind of immigrant, but um, not a forced immigrant. I've worked mm -hmm. with, you know, refugees, and it's very different, um, not to draw a comparison. But, yeah, I first engaged when I wanted, I first, my first idea for the work was actually to yodel through the streets at night when the pubs would empty out at that time, when it would really echo through the city, and I wanted to make a whole sound piece with, with it actually mm -hmm. broadcast on radio, um, and that nobody would actually see me unless they found me. And I really liked this idea, and I still like this idea a lot. But there was something about the kind of loneliness of it that it just kept reiterating the loneliness of this cowboy. Um, and actually, what I wanted to do was engage with people and institutions and connect institutions, because that's what I do in my work. So um, rather than going the like, woe is me, I'm so lonely, nostalgic, you know, Patsy Cline walking at midnight, um, I went with, you know, this how can I bring together all these different institutions and make them talk to each other and, and, and groups? So, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of, you know, the site specific, that's what, you know, it's about kind of group bringing together, you know, different groups of people that may not meet. That's something I like, but also really got the chance to engage in, in uh, a context where I live. Um, that's not always the case. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm making work that's, um, you know, where I get to spend not as much time with, but try to engage with that same depth. One Quite particularly depth. interesting uh, historical uh, element of your lecture to me was when you spoke about the uh, women cowboys yeah. and uh, suffrage. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is a really complicated one. West and um, uh, living uh, yeah. on the farm, yeah, or yeah. uh, well, on the ranch, is, yeah. is actually, uh, that's another very interesting uh, research yeah. area. It's yeah. a huge, I mean, it's, it's so interesting that, you know. Frontier women. Yeah. yeah. That they, it was because these women went out to do that, that they proved that they, you know, could, um, they could represent, they could, you know, they could do all those things that men do, that they then got the vote. And then the vote, uh, the right to vote was won in the West. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's just been, that com that's what, for me, complicates all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where, you know, the embrace of um, the cowgirl then is a completely, you know, complex. We can't look at any of these as black and white and having this kind of dialectic, you know, there's a real complexity there and why I think there's so much traction then by different groups embracing that for different reasons. But then it gets really complicated. Then it's Sarah Palin, who's the cowboy, you know, and the cowboy, <laughs> then I go, whoa, okay, we're not in the same, you know, so yeah. it's, you know, it becomes this, this hat that everybody wants to wave and wear and, so, but it's a, you know, it's a, yeah, it is huge um, opportunity for research there. That's that I, you know, this is what I. The other thing I wanted to bring to the dialogue with with Jimmy Durham was, you know, where's the cowgirl? Because she doesn't appear, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. for that one mention of Annie Oakley, um, and maybe in some paintings that are are there. But there's very little in the in the exhibition, The American West. Um, but there's very little thought, I, you know, because it's tricky. It's a complicated one, and and I hope you know to open really that up with him. In that sense, are concealed too. Yeah, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, 
gen gen yeah. so gender and race. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, and uh, women, <laughs> women of color on ranches, uh, yep. uh, uh, like uh, black cowboys. Uh, like yeah, yeah. Complicated. Uh, I yeah, absolutely. Mix up. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. And that's in the show, The American West. He deals with, with that. Um, yeah. It's mm -hmm. quite interesting paintings of, of black cowboys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I think you gave us uh, so much to grapple with. And uh, since the um, uh, presentation will be available online, I hope that we can pass it on to some of our younger students. I know that some of our third year undergraduates are working on site-specific performance and mm. um, it will be helpful for them to reflect on what you said. We do appreciate your coming. Well, thank you for inviting thank me. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we will wrap up slowly. <coughs>